what do you see as the role of a product owner? I think even in a small team, you have a person who is the product owner, it just might also be a developer. The lack of a decision is a decision. I think the anti-pattern that people have is that they think process is a bad word, but no process is worse than the minimum amount of process. And I think it's really important to do that officially because otherwise you just get caught up and just, oh my god, there's always something happening. Hi, I'm Paul Berger, founder of CircleCI. I'm Edith Harba, CEO and co-founder at LaunchDarkly. And you're listening to To Be Continuous, a podcast about continuous delivery and software development. You can get in touch with us anytime at our Twitter handle, at ContinuousCast. The show is brought to you by Heavybit. To learn more, visit heavybit.com. And while you're there, check out their library, home to great educational talks from other developer company founders and industry leaders. I think there's still kind of this cult of the lone wolf, Mm -hmm. like banging out code in a corner that I think is very Mm -hmm. harmful. Uh, organizations often optimize for that, especially ones that, again, not naming names here, but like I can think of organizations that, that deliberately hire solo engineers. And as a result, there's no appetite for team. You know, everyone's just sort of working on their own. Yeah. And I, I've seen that really blow up because mm-hmm. it's like you're not really producing anything bigger than one person. Mm-hmm. If your unit is basically how hard can one person work. Mm-hmm. You're not going to produce so, anything bigger. So this is sort of the the model that I see in open source a lot. Organizations make room for lots of individuals, but there's nothing that's like team related. So very often, you know, there, there won't be roadmaps. There's the you see, you saw GitHub talk about this, and it's like you know the uh, code talks and something else. Co- walks code talks, and, bullshit walks. There, yeah, so, so something along those lines. It's like the idea that, that that the right way to approach a project is to come with code written and then we'll have a conversation rather yes. than like a you know, have a direction and a roadmap and a, and a list of things that we want people to fix. And But that's so wasteful if you just think about it. Like yeah, If you that, just think about point. it from manufacturing terms, mm-hmm. like if you just think about it in terms of you're trying to optimize for reduction of inventory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Code is inventory. Well, so if you've had ten people go out and write a thousand lines of code, you don't yeah. have ten thousand lines of code. Well, the, I you think you probably a, have a hundred lines of working code. Right, but you're not if you're not paying for the work that comes in. Ah, right. In in open source terms, you set it up to get like to the, get like drive by contributions or something like that. Or there's a lot of people who want to contribute, and you spend more time trying to keep them at arm's length than in in actually wanting to accept their code. Well, I think that's really a really interesting way to put it because it's basically a supply demand problem. Because like the, the yeah, major, so yeah. like there are a couple extremely popular open source projects mm-hmm. where they do have this oversupply. Yeah, and everyone else is starving. Everyone else is starving. Yeah, and and, and then like ma- and then I think maintainers pick up this bad model. or like, oh, I'm the mm-hmm. maintainer. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to pick up the the Linus Torvalds model. Yeah, instead yeah. of being like, hey, my biggest problem is not people bringing all this dumb code that I need to scream at them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. My biggest problem is that nobody cares, mm-hmm. and and even worse, somebody does care. Mm-hmm. And they spend a week reading this code. Yep. And then I have to break it to them that it's not actually. It's not necessary. It's not valuable. Or uh, you, you see teams uh, or you see products accepting PRs because like they're there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and then you have this very real churn problem. Yep. Because like related people... to that is the is the problem. Like, did you ever go to one of these projects on GitHub and there's like fifty open PRs, and they're just like inundated with. PRs that are all wrong because they haven't set up their environment or that they haven't set up their project in a way that they can actually accept incoming work. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to like, um, I, I studied economics as well as engineering. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a whole thing about behavioral economics about how do you encourage mm-hmm. people to do something bigger than they are? Mm-hmm. You have to set up a framework mm-hmm. where people feel like they can contribute and be valued. Mm-hmm. And I think yep, that yep. is the heart of being a good manager. Yes. Is that setting up a path where people mm-hmm. feel like um, I talked a lot about this with a friend of this idea of contributed, valued, respected. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, yep. I think that is, I mean, that's my definition of a good mm-hmm. manager is that they're encouraging people on the right path. And in open source, this this doesn't exist. I, I mean, you, you're not employing the people on your project for the most part. I think, Someone else might be employing them, but you're not. I think and maybe that's where open source is not... Like so, there's a ton of volunteer projects. Mm-hmm. And I see outside of open source. I mean, most volunteer organizations mm-hmm. have to set up a structure like this. That's interesting, yeah, right? Because they're they're meeting in person and they're not. Well, I, I'm going to correct myself there. I, I was going to say not made up of like an introverts and engineers, but I think actually that that is also a faulty model of. Well, there are volunteers all over the world who have yeah. never met each other. 
Like if you look at an organization like, um, I don't want to say the Red Cross, but um, there are many volunteer organizations where mm-hmm. they're widely distributed throughout the world right? and they have to coordinate and yeah. they have to get people to work for free. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they somehow successfully do it because they've set up a structure where people. It's probably because they don't only communicate via an issue tracker. <laughs> Every now and then, you make me laugh. It's 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 a well, crazy idea. It is how open source projects do it, and it's often how companies that model themselves after. So so like Mozilla is a good example here. Mozilla does everything in Bugzilla. That is becoming less true, but certainly when I was there, if you wanted to like, I don't know, get an air conditioning event fixed, <laughs> you, you, you filed an issue in Bugzilla. So I think my theory about waiting until you've already built something to give mm-hmm. feedback is exactly the wrong time to give it. Yeah. Because this person has worked on it. Yeah, yeah. And they have this endowment effect. Yeah. And they, they take it very personally. Mm-hmm. Of course, I mean, they, they, they wrote this code and, and often they had this idea and you're telling them that, that one or both are bad. And they probably worked on their own time, and they yep. were really proud and happy and ready to get the little pat on the head and show it off. Yep. Instead, you're just like slapping it out of their hands and being like, "This is stupid." Mm. Literally. Yeah. This was my major failure mode at Circle. So we, we we believed in flat, and we didn't believe in product managers, and and so on. We we didn't particularly like meetings, and that sort of uh, culture was was you know from the founders and 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 also from the you know, the, the the early employees that we, you know, we hired people who were sort of on the same page. And as a result, we didn't have a we didn't have a shared direction. If we didn't have a shared direction, everyone is like figuring it on their own what what to build. The result is when am I uh, as as the CEO able to exert direct uh, influence on on the outcomes? It's after the pull request is made. Oh, which is the worst time. It was, it was I mean it was so bad, and people got so pissed off, and they were and they were right to get pissed off as well. So like we 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 set up this environment where. People would build things, and then they would show up at the end, like ta-da! And, and they, then and I'd be and, like, "No, that's wrong." And you know what they were waiting for, Paul? What were they waiting for? They were waiting for the CEO mm-hmm. to say, "Oh, this is awesome! Thank you so much for contributing. We're happy you're here." Right. And instead, yeah. What and instead, they- I'm like, "Oh, this isn't the right direction." Yeah, I, I know, I know, I know. I'm feel I'm feeling shame as as you stare at me as as I should be feeling shame. Well, you know, literally, they, this is their moment to shine. I know, I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this was major early problem that that we had. That because we believed so strongly in in flat, even though we had no definition of, of what that meant, that we wouldn't even like set ourselves roadmaps or sprints or we wouldn't even talk about what we we're going to do. It's just like everyone, everyone figures it out for themselves. But it wasn't. Don't, don't do this. But it wasn't <laughs> flat because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, yeah, exactly. It was like flatland, but with a point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And all oh, these poor people. Yeah, I, I know, I know. And ironically, so people had this complaint, but the method that they wanted to change it to was like, where I don't do that, which kind of which kind of makes sense. Well, um, but but wasn't addressing the other problems of like, well, we kind of need a project in the in the same direction. People didn't want more meetings. They didn't want more management. They didn't want more process. All these these were like dirty words. But you had a process. Well, we had a process and it was terrible, and we needed to change to a different process. But that seemed like more. So people. And always, they wanted less. Like so, that you had a process, and it was yes. people squandered. Yes. Yes. Pe- I, weeks I, I, of their times, yep, yep. if not months. Yep. And had their feelings hurt. Yep. That that is exactly so right. So that is the process. That was the process we had. Yeah. Yeah. Like, no. I know. Yeah. I know. The the feeling you have is the feeling that that was had. Of the just the, oh, just the waste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The 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 waste, the hurt feelings, the 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 anger, the uh, uh, it's uh, yeah. It's so terrible. so so how did you how did you become not that person? Well, let me just clarify. I don't think it's about being that kind of person. It's that we set up that kind of process. There's this term called psychological safety, mm-hmm. where it's that you feel safe making mistakes. Mm-hmm. So I, I try really hard to encourage that at my own company. Of mm-hmm. Like, um, like it's okay to make mistakes as long as like. We iterate quickly and mm-hmm. move, and I want to create that attitude. And that's why we have stuff like here's our roadmap. We have our weekly goals. We have our so we try to have enough meetings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, for sure. Like the no meetings is a, is an anti pattern. Yeah. Uh, and when when so me and Ellen when we when we started the new company we had weekly two person meetings even though we talked all the time. Yeah. Like the and we you know here's what we are going to do this week. Here are the things we are looking to accomplish. Here's the the ideas that we're going to validate. And our rough plan of attack for it. And I think it's really important to do that officially because otherwise you just get caught up and just, oh my God, there's always something happening. There, there, there always is, yeah. 
And then and then the next week you could say like, okay, we want to do this, we didn't do this, why not? Mm-hmm. And a lot of times it's like, well, this other thing happened, that's fine. Yeah, but yeah, like, ex- exactly. Yeah. But yeah. like, let's acknowledge that. Right. And the I think the anti pattern that that people have is that they think process is a bad word, when in fact you always there have a was, process. Well, yes, but no process is worse than like the minimum amount of process that that. Well, there's could work. always my, my thing is there's always a process you're following. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure, sure. So, so your process was people built stuff mm-hmm. and presented to you, and you and you rejected or blessed. Yeah, but I I think people think of process as like a you know you 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 set up a process and and, and they it's almost a, a sunk cost fallacy sort of thing that that like when you look at something that you didn't build that 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 just sort of happened that's that's not really process but like when you look at you know we we have a list of things that we are going to do and we're going to do them in a meeting on Monday at at nine a.m. Then that's like then that's process, and I think that, that that there isn't a great realization that having no process, and as, as you say, there is real process in, in in no process, but that is the worst possible process. Yeah, I mean, because I saw it so often, because it would be like what I saw was the lack of a decision is a decision. Mm-hmm. So here's a real world example from about ten years ago. It's like, should we keep working on fix packs for old customers mm-hmm. or new features for new customers? Mm-hmm. Nobody made a decision. When what happened was all the individual developers mm-hmm. made decisions, and what did they work on? Uh, they worked on all these new shiny features, which mm-hmm. were not actually new shiny features that the business wanted, and we didn't fix the bugs the customers wanted. Mm-hmm. Wonderful, because all these developers had these great intentions. Yeah, yeah. And it was like the worst of all decisions because mm-hmm. we didn't fix the bugs, we didn't build the right features, and we end up with all this other random stuff. There is this idea of of the sort of the hero developer. Right, the the hero developer sees that that this thing can be done in better ways, comes up with the idea themselves, and and then it is much beloved by the organization. The customers are in love with it, and you, there are like four or five like Skunkworks project stories at like Google or Facebook. Gmail, or, or, Gmail is the classic one. Yeah, Gmail, great great example. There's a couple of Apple stories like it that that are just like this. This thing was amazing if they just like you know kept it down and snuck it in, and everyone else is copying this, and that's and it's. Terrible in the general case. I think there's always going to be this wild flash in the pans that are going to happen. A lot of times what happens, and I saw this over and over and over again, is you build stuff that nobody wants, Mm -hmm. which is the worst case. Yep. And I've seen so much, I call it just wasted, because you build stuff nobody wants. Yep, yep. Or what's better is you build stuff that somebody wants, Mm -hmm. and nobody knows about it. I did this fallacy. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'll say something I said when I was younger, which is, "This is a great product. We mm-hmm. don't need marketing." Oh, which is just like the product will market itself. Mm-hmm. It's like no, so you need somebody. I mean, this is why. Like, this is like why I do the podcast. This is mm-hmm. why I go to talk at conferences. This is why we write blogs. It's mm-hmm. like people don't organically know that you exist. Mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm completely agreeing with you. I've seen so many so many startups that have that exact problem, and. They're often, especially if they're developers, they're dismissive of marketing. They don't know the difference between marketing and sales, and they're dismissive of all of it. Well, I mean, I, I, I've seen it over and over and over again of like, well, we'll just focus on building the product. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, how will people know that you exist? There's a pattern of people who they see successful products and they don't see the marketing that was behind the successful products because they were so good at the marketing. Yeah. So I think a lot of people in, in developer tools, Model themselves after either Stripe or GitHub, and both of those are terrible examples to model <laughs> themselves out of. Because one, they were so successful that any flaw they had, they could just overcome by the strength of like, their product market fit, or, or in GitHub's case, the the virality of it. And people look. Uh, we were talking about flatness earlier. People, you know, took flatness direct from GitHub and Stripe. Um, I know we did, and they didn't work for them. Well, and they didn't work for anyone else either. But those companies survived or did well because they were so successful anyway. There's a company called Valve. Yep. Which is, oh my God, the original. Which is held up as like the we don't need managers. Everybody just wheels their chairs. Yep. Yeah. 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 They never managed to ship. They never managed to ship. Oh, Half Life Three. Yeah. 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 It doesn't matter. They're they're making money hand over fist on on Steam. Yeah, and and that's the thing. If you're making Money hand over fist, it doesn't matter. You can delay your flagship product for ten years. I, I think there's been four or five different attempts to build Half Life Three that have all failed. Yeah, it doesn't matter if the money's coming in. Well, it's like Google; they had this one core mm-hmm. thing that they could do all these moonshots. Yeah, you should really take Darian's class. 
I should take Deering's class. It's on my it's on my to do list. What will I learn in Deering's class? Well, so he has another book about orbiting the giant hairball. Okay. Which is that you have to have some core engine, which is basically the hairball, which gets stuff done, mm-hmm. and then you also have to have creativity, which is kind of orbiting it. Okay. But you do need to have both. You can't just have these people out orbiting in outer space. Mm-hmm. Is that the the hero engineers in our in our analogy? Oh, I do think engineers are heroes. I just think um, no, but I mean the specific ones of like who, who well who who think they're heroes or who are planning for the the grand heroic gesture, or grand heroic pull request, maybe. Yeah, the the thing that will save the entire company. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I noticed at Circle, and I think I think this this generalizes that the thing that you're good at, your company does not become good at because you can do it. Right, and so in in our case, it was, it was content marketing that like I was I was pretty good at content marketing, and so we we never built uh, while I was in charge, we never built a content marketing team. In fact, any real marketing team, because like oh, you know, Paul, Paul will just whip out a post, something like that, yeah. And that was really just not like, and mostly because I never actually gave myself time to to write them because I was doing everything else. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I, so I ran into you know Des. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had known who he was, and it was weird because I finally met him in person. Mm-hmm. It's funny you can you can say Des, and I think a large number of people will know exactly who you're talking about. No surname, no company name required. Yeah, well, yeah. I knew that you knew because like, oh, well, because well, yeah, like all yeah. Irish know. Like, oh, right, of course, of course. He was talking about how like he built the blog. We and should then, clarify that we're talking about Des Trainer from Intercom. Yeah, it's like okay, it, okay. He was giving me tips on content marketing and. Mm-hmm. and and but he did. He was good at content marketing, but he he built a machine. He was yeah, 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 yeah. But like the intercom, the the early success of intercom, and I could be wrong about this. And apologies, Owen, if if you disagree with this. But to me, it was built on the amazing, like the extraordinary content marketing uh, that the that Des did on the intercom blog. I think all companies have one, hopefully two, and maybe three things they're really good at. Mm-hmm. And you just got to really double down on those. Yeah, yeah. And and that's what he did really well that I think most companies don't do really well. They see the skills of their founders not as things that need to be taken away from the founders, but things that need to be kept with the founders. Yeah, and that's that's what I'm trying to do. Like, um, we hired a dev evangelist because mm-hmm. I was like, I can't, I can't keep giving talks. Yeah, just, yeah. The, the 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 travel uh, was killing me. And I'll bet, and you you probably shouldn't answer this, but like, I'll bet that the dev evangelist is not as good as it as you are. Because you've been doing it for years, and and like they will take time to get to the level of success that you get out of it. Well, the joke is that I was a terrible speaker when I started. Right, but you've been doing it for years now. I like literally and, remember that the reason why I started a podcast with mm-hmm. you was that I wasn't very good at talks, and it was easier when I I felt like I was just talking to a friend. Mm. Like so, it was like it was much easier for me to get in a room and just talk than to get up on a stage. Yeah, because I was just like I remember I oh, was awful. Mm-hmm. I remember when we went to Web Summit. I, I went into the bathroom and I, I was just felt like I was going to be physically ill. You were great at Web Summit, or is it the one we went to, or a different one? The one we went to. Oh, no, you were great. Well, that's because like I looked at you, I looked at Matt. Oh. I'm just like I'm hanging out with my friends. This yeah, is okay. Yeah, yeah. But it was bad. Oh wow! Yeah, d- didn't even notice you. you. You hid that well. I used to literally hide in the bathroom. Mm. Wow. And so I, I, the joke is that people think I'm a good speaker, but I was like, no, I was very bad. But you got good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. There's a lot of things, mostly related to marketing, where the founder has a natural talent at it. Because you're the founder, people give you the benefit, the doubt on it. Because like there's there's an authentic voice, and so the, the, there's the authenticity of the founder selling, the authenticity of the founder, you know, going on stage and talking about it, and and you lose a bunch of that when you start to try to outsource it to someone else on your team. But there's no alternative. Yeah, you, uh, can, you can't, can't keep doing no, it. No, I yeah. was just like, because literally, I was like, I cannot. Keep doing this. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. So that's what I, I, I hate to name drop him. I met him once, but like that's what does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Does, does like he used to go to every conference. Now he's just like I can't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Looking at how they, uh, I think they have a book about this, but like how they built that team up. Yeah. Uh, the do you know that the the editor of the Irish Times of the Irish Times became the editor of like the Intercom content marketing team. Yeah. That's that's the kind of like. Bold step they did, or sort of innovative step they did to like to make their their content uh, as good as it is. So I asked at the same conference. Uh, I talked to Nicholas from Algolia. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Such a nice guy. Oh, was this at the the heavy bit uh, content marketing conference? No, this was at Web Summit. Oh, this is Web Summit. Okay. But yeah. I mean, I I knew him from 
I met him a couple times in the States. So yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was talking about how he gave speech training to all, all their engineers. So that they can give talks. Yep. Yeah, that, that that's a great idea. Yeah, because I was talking about how I, I feel like I've always encouraged people to give talks yeah. and they never want to do them. I, I, I see this at the at the current marketing team at, at, at Circle, which is excellent. And one of the realizations and the, the phrase our, our VP of marketing uses is, is by developers for developers. And the marketing team is not developers. I mean, it has some developers on it who, who code. But for the most part, it's experienced marketers. And what they know is that, that the authentic voice is something that can't come directly from the marketer as it might in another vertical. And so they have to pull content out of uh, out of engineers. They have to have engineers go give talks. And so the, the, the marketing team is are not people necessarily who market, but they become people who sort of coordinate, at least on the content side. Yeah. Oh my gosh. When I started the company, I spoke once to like two people. Mm-hmm. And I was happy two people came because it was far less humiliating than no one. Yeah. Yeah. Zero would be a. Mm. But I think our developers, they, they go give these talks and they're like, mm-hmm. this is awful. Yeah, like once when somebody one of somebody went to meet up and nobody came. Oh no! And they get really shy and they don't want to do it again. I'm just like, no. I went to this talk years ago. I was I was speaking at it. It was the the Stack Overflow did a conference once in like 2009, and people reviewed every speaker who who spoke at at Stack Overflow, and they, they did in like 16 cities or something like that. So you you could see it happening. It's like the the LA thing was talking. There was reviews, and then some people were like panned. So I, I talked to the London one, and there was there was two speakers who wrote public apologies on their blogs afterwards because the reviews were so like critical. Oh no! Could you imagine? Were were they really that bad, or were just people very critical? They weren't great, but like you know, bad talks happen. Bad you're, talks happen. You're, you're not a bad person if if you had a bad talk, you misjudged the audience. The the audio was bad. I don't know what what causes people to to have bad talks. I had this bad talk. I was um. <laughs> <laughs> soft tech wanted me to speak at their their summit. I hear they're not soft tech anymore. They're uncork now. Thanks for asking. And I was very proud. So Annie, my VC, our investor, said, mm-hmm. "I want you to talk about your running." I said, mm-hmm. "Great." I have this talk I gave in Oslo, mm-hmm. and he got the slides. He's like, "Are you sure you could do this in five minutes?" Mm-hmm. Well, no one said. And, uh, he's like, "All you have is ten minutes." Mm-hmm. I'm like, "Well, I did it before when the slides auto advanced because mm-hmm. I given his lightning talk. That'll be fine." Oh, uh, and they didn't auto advance. And you kept talking. The worst, they auto advanced. Oh, they did auto advance. And I'm like, you gotta be in a mood. Oh, interesting. They auto advanced at a speed of five minutes. Yeah. The talk was supposed to be ten minutes. Oh, interesting. You had set them to auto advance. But I thought they would clean it out because they put this into the master deck. Uh... So I reviewed them with the the lady before on stage. Everything great. Yeah. I got up on stage and the slides were moving at double speed. Uh... <laughs> 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 and you don't have a control? I have a control and I keep hitting it. Yeah. And I'm like, the slides are moving. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> and um and it was one of those awful things where they'd put it into this huge master deck. And, oh um, no. Do you know what I mean? So I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you you can't go back and change it. Yeah, for all for all the hassle of like swapping out laptops, at least you know what you're getting. And uh so I said, like, look, just please stop it. I'll mm-hmm. just talk. Mm-hmm. Cause like Good plan. I'm like, this is far less stressful than me trying to talk double speed. Mm-hmm. Fuck it, we'll do it live. Yeah, so we did it live. And mm-hmm. like, it was not the greatest talk I'd ever give, but oh my gosh. So do you give talks now for dark or are you still keeping it dark? Uh, still keeping it dark. We, we, we haven't decided on the name. And until we get a name, which, which I think we we're rushing for because it is hard to, it is hard to hire people when your, your company name is Ellen and Paul's new startup.com. Why, why is that so? It's, it's just so uh, because it just feels a little too early for people like the I don't know and a name ap- appears to be a big deal for seeming credible as a small company. A turning point for us was when we got a logo. Interesting. I wonder if that'll become the next bottleneck. Just remove bottleneck after bottleneck and but yeah, we we're nowhere near a logo either. Yeah, I literally remember so like um I think it was like the second day after John and I started working full time. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. We we came up with our name. Okay. Because like we need to tell people where we work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We we had a plan of uh, buying Dark Dot Lee, <laughs> and then setting up a launch page on it at launch dot Dark Dot Lee. Yeah, you you told me about this and I was not pleased. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, Dark Dot Lee is fifteen hundred dollars. That's uh, it's it's not that much, but it's a lot to prank you. <laughs> I, I I'm honored that this would 
crossed your mind that yeah yeah, yeah. for for thirty dollars I'd have pranked you, but for fifteen hundred dollars I don't think it's worth it. So what's the break point? Is it like around? Is it once you get into triple digits? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I I, th- I think maybe eighty dollars would be like. Eh. Yeah, this is funny. Yeah, it's 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 funny. I think I think this might be worth about a hundred dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, I mean, once you've you know minted your millions on your new thing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that'll that'll just be something you'll dash off to your to your admin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Purchase dark. Mock Edith. <laughs> We could just have a have a standing task every month. <laughs> have, I, have we mocked Edith this month? Not I, yet. I have a friend. I won't say his name, but um, he was in an accelerator, mm-hmm. and his company got acquired two years ago. Mm-hmm. I'm sure with just that information, we could figure out who it is. Mm, I fudged the date a little. Okay. But I found this out because I was visiting a customer, and I saw him walking down the stairs, mm-hmm. and uh, the the customer's like, "Oh yeah, we just acquired you know so and so's company." I was just mm-hmm. like. Mm-hmm. And I texted him. I'm like, so you got acquired? He's like, yeah, but we're keeping it secret, but I'm going to have a party soon. Okay. I'm like, great. And then like I saw him two months later. I'm like, what about the party? He's like, I'll have it next month. So every month I text him mm-hmm. and I say, when is the party going to be? Because he still hasn't had his acquisition party. Or he had the party and he didn't invite you. Oh. oh. I'm sure that's not true. So it's funny. So in February of this year, he said he would do it by end of year. Mm-hmm. So now I'm February. At, and now I'm at the point where like every month I'm like, hey dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm dying for this fucking party. <laughs> it's been built up so much at this point. Well, I'm like, I'm like basically like I will have IPO before you have your party. Uh, so we got some really exciting guests coming up. Oh, who do we have? Should we tease them? Sure, sure. Let, let's do this. Um, so it's both of their birthdays that day. Who is it? Somebody who is gonna say a lot of interesting things. Can we give them a first name? Armin. And there's another person, right? Glenn. Okay. Armin and Glenn, whoever they are. And their birthday is the day they're coming in. And so you will hear this three months after that. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of To Be Continuous, brought to you by Heavybit and hosted by me, Paul Baker of Circle CI, and Edith Harbaugh of Launch Darkly. To learn more about Heavybit, visit heavybit.com. While you're there, check out their library, home to great educational talks from other developer company founders and industry leaders. Thank you.